So welcome to our second to last talk uh, on this track today. Um, Nicole Rauch, she is a, a, well, a <laughs> independent software developer and development coach. And I was told not to uh, tell you too much about the talk itself. Because so. <laughs> I'm the speaker. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. Wow, my words. Excellent. So, yeah, this is a, a little bit about event sourcing. So, um, whenever you have any questions or remarks or whatever, please shout out or, you know, just make yourself seen to me. And, uh, yeah, I would like to be uh, a bit interactive and have some discussion and questions and stuff because I think we have plenty of time, and so let's see about this. Has anybody ever done anything event sourcing like, sort of? Oh, here and there, okay, good. So let's see. Um, and if you um, disagree with, with what I'm saying, then I'm of course also interested in that. All right? So, um, this is uh, what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, first of all, what is this event sourcing stuff anyway? And then uh, we look at event sourcing in the back end, which is like the traditional way of event sourcing, but I've also discovered and I'm also using in my current project event sourcing in the front end and also between front end and back end. And so we'll have a look at that as well. And then we really get at what the um, title promised event sourcing all over the place. Okay? So, event sourcing. Or if uh, what uh, somebody once told me, you can also call it don't drop data. And we, we will come to this in a minute. What is the classical approach? Well, usually you have a relational database. And, uh, but the issue with a relational database is that you only capture the current state. So you never know what, what was there before unless you take special measurements like backups or, you know, some sorts of logging or whatever, but it's quite difficult to actually get information about what was there before. And maybe more importantly, you also don't know why there was a certain change in your database, in your data, right? And um, so the idea is uh, behind event sourcing is that you want to keep track of everything that happened, every event, you have every change in your data, you just keep a, a record of them. And then if you have all these records, then you can derive the current application state from all of these records. A classical example would be a bank account. Right? You can see that quite clearly, and I guess everybody has seen something like that before. So maybe I opened my bank account at some, some point in time over here, um, and then the bank would send me a certain amount of money as a welcome gift, maybe. Or because somebody recommended me or something, you know. You would get some money. Then I would get a payment, like my income, for example. Then I would need to pay something out, my rent. And maybe then there's my birthday and my granny sends me some money for my birthday. And so you can clearly see what happened there, all the changes ever and why they happened. And then you can calculate from all of this how much money I currently have in my um, bank account, right? And uh, this is a standard thing, and I think nobody ever thinks about this. And you can always recreate the current amount from all the records. I mean, if you have your account for 10 or 20 years, then of course it's a bit more tedious, but you can do that, right? And uh, yes, like I said. And then we have this don't drop data thing. So what, what is data that often gets dropped? So I mean, if I keep this in a, in a relational database, then I still see the sum of, my, my, of the current money I have, and so is the problem. Well, what often gets dropped is what actually changed, why it changed, when it changed, how often it changed, and whether it changed together with something else, or in isolation, or sometimes like this, sometimes like that, together with which data did it change, and so on and so on. So all these things are lost, because you only look at the end result in a relational database. For example, 
let's assume we keep uh, we have customers in our database, right? Most applications have that. So we have this recording of the database in the database, and now a change happens. Did you notice what happened? <laughs> let's go back again. So this is the data before. Right, so somebody knows, noticed it, if you look at the name here, and it changes to person without the dots. Okay? So, changes can be so subtle that you don't even properly notice that there was a change. And if we look at uh, the same situation in a relational, uh, in an event sourced uh, scenario, then we would have, have our current read model that has the same data, and then we would see an event. And the event would state that the last name got changed, and to what? And now we can much better pick up that there is actually a change in the name. But this still drops data. What, what data is dropped here? What do you think? What it was before. So we see what it was before. So, so this uh, current read model, of course, is created from other events. So we ha have an event that keeps track of the, the previous name. And now we have the, the new name, right? So we can see what it was before because it's in our event stream. But what, what data gets dropped here? When did it happen? When did it happen? No, you know, okay. So uh, this is a bit short. Usually you would also have a timestamp on this. So we could still see when did it happen. Did it happen in isolation or with others, uh, other actions together? We don't see that. If it's an isolated event or if there are other things going on. So that you would also see in your event stream because no, you would wouldn't see it in, in there. That's something that would be dropped. Or is it not? The information, if. So this is now uh, supposed to be an event stream. Yeah. And then if we have other events that change things, we also see them okay. like okay. with a sort of similar timestamp or with a very different timestamp or not at all. So, so that would be there. So what, what's being dropped here? Well, all the rest of the data and the first time is read. I would like to have the whole object so I can reason about it because here I only have the the previous data? What? No, the previous data you can see and you can also see the other data because here you could repeat the whole object here, but you don't have to because only this thing changed. This so the why. The why, exactly, there you go. Why did this happen? Did somebody just fix a typo? Because you know somebody took the name on the phone and then they thought, oh yeah, this is a standard German name. And then it turns out this was an American person, and they, they didn't have the dots on the U, so somebody fixed this later on. Maybe the person actually got married. I mean, this, this would be a very, very interesting coincidence, but can you actually exclude it that somebody called Müller gets married to a person called Müller? I wouldn't be able to exclude this in general terms, right? Maybe the person got divorced. Or maybe the person had some other name, uh, other reason to change their name. I don't know, some legal reason, or maybe they moved to a different country and then they changed their name, or whatever. No idea, and you cannot find this out. And the thing is, maybe your business wants to react on one of these occasions and not on others. For example, you might want to send them a congratulations card if somebody got married. But if you send them a congratulations card when they got divorced, that might be, well, okay. So. so, what you actually want to do is you want to capture the reason why something happened. Right, so previously I just said last name changed, and yeah, technically this is correct, but from an event sourcing to a point of view, this is really, really poor. So, you can get much better. You can, you can track a whole lot more on why something happened. Can I make a remark? Oh, of course. Uh, you're essentially loading context information on, on the essential Yes, yes. And the, the problem is, I guess, that the context is always infinite. There's always more context you could add. Yes, of course. Yeah. 
So you, what, you, what you can do is you can start out with like your expected context. You could add more context later, like more events at a later point in time without even influencing your implementation. So you would then add a, this new type to your implementation, but that wouldn't influence your old event stream because you're just adding something to it. Um, and this is totally valid to like learn something about the world and the software and then later on, you know, add to it. And for a relational database, that this would be more of a hassle because you would need to add the field and, and add a new type, and then everything might, you know, get weird. And yeah, this would be more of an issue to add this. And here, it's it's quite. You you could uh, of course also say other, like as a generic catch-all thing, right? So you know it's none of the other things, and maybe you, you don't care which exactly it is, and then that's fine too. But you, ha you have these uh, opportunities, so you can add the new event type to your, your whole chain, and then uh, go with it. Yeah, but right, we are, we are adding here uh, context information or semantic information. Okay, so in order to not drop data, event sourcing helps us because it, it captures reasons for the changes we are applying. And uh, we, it allows us to reflect on changes later on. And also, if we later on discover a new feature we would like to implement based on the old data, we can do that because we still have all of this data. We just captured the raw information without probably without even knowing that there might be a feature that we could use this for um, but if we later on decide to implement this this is very very cheap to do I once uh, worked in a company and they uh, started event sourcing a part of their application so they happen to have um, old data um, of events, so they could easily recreate like 10 years of event sourcing data. And then we, we ran a session, so um, developers and product people uh, got together for a like, three hour session or something. And we start, so, so somebody had implemented this events, uh, event sourcing with all these events, and um, a small team, and then everybody would get together and would design new features. And the developers would then implement those features like as prototypes very, very quickly. And uh, after that, we all got together and showed the features to each other. And this was so amazing how many new features and interesting, valuable features we could actually build within two or three hours off of the data, just because the data was there and didn't drop the information anymore. But you wouldn't have been able to off of a, a relational database. So, this is like the basic, like how event sourcing works. And now let's look at how event sourcing in the backend would work. So a standard scenario is um, we have uh, the event sourcing in the application server and we use the events instead of a relational database. So we actually only store the events, right? And no database at all. And then whenever we start the system, we reconstruct the current data off of all of the, the events we have there. So let's look at this a bit more in detail, how this works. So my example is um, a conference ticket sales system. So we can buy tickets for Bobcon, probably <laughs> off of this system. Okay, so this is the start. Here we have the UI where you can buy the tickets. And then there's this user, and the user sends a command. Do this, okay? And the command then uh, goes into the backend and ends up in something called a command processor. Like for example, this is an administrator and they would initially say, I want to sell so many tickets. And so he goes and sets the ticket quota. And so with this, set the ticket quota, the command processor says, okay, now the ticket quota is that. And so creates an event ticket quota was set, so events are always in the past because events are something that has already happened. So we only capture things that have happened and nothing 
perspective. Okay, so here the command, pro the, the user says, please set the quota and the command processor says, okay, I did this. And then adds another, uh, a new event to our event store, to our log here. So this is the easy thing because there is nothing that can go wrong or doesn't work out. Um, and then the new data is um, the, the event store gets then processed into something called read models. So this is our actual current data. And this is then being used um, in the front end again for you know, displaying like the new number of tickets that's uh, available overall or something. Okay? Do you say read because you're trying to contrast with like CRUD style? Data updates in place. Ah, okay. No. So this is used for for reading the information into the UI. The writing part is here, and we get to that in a minute. And then we also have a write model. Thank you. So here we have a projection, like a fold, right, or a reduce, um, and we fold over all of those events, and then we get to this read model. Or we have many read models for many use cases, like every website, web page might have their individual read models or something. Okay? So, and this here is actually our source of truth. So whatever gets in here, this is like how the world is for our application. And now, uh, this is no longer the administrator, but some user who wants to participate in the conference. And they say, oh, book me a ticket, please. Okay? So, and then the con command processor says, yeah, maybe, can I actually book this ticket for this person? Because maybe it's sold out, or maybe this person already bought a ticket. Maybe we have this uh, contract that each person can only buy one ticket. Maybe, I don't know, depends on our business logic. And so here the command processor now actually needs to decide which case it is. And so they need uh, some help, and that's where the uh, right model kicks in. So, so I don't know if this is a general term. I learned this when I learned event sourcing. Um, and so I, I, for me, it's quite understandable. But if you, if you use different terms, then we can, of course, discuss this. Um, so here we have this right model, because this is used for the writing of the event. And the command processor now can, can refer to this right model. And maybe the right model says, oh yeah, we have no spaces left in the conference. And then the command processor, based off of this information, decides that the event would be sold out. And the person cannot get the ticket. Okay? So, and now we actually, and this is also something new com uh, compared to relational databases in most cases. We actually capture the information that somebody tried to buy a ticket but failed because it's already sold out. And you often don't have this information in relational databases either. Sure, I don't know. Go ahead. So, so but now we have like interactions with the user uh, on, in two places, right? We have the immediate responses, which can be. Uh, where it's on the right side, like all the tickets are sold out, you can't do that, and you have the, or we update your whole, inter your whole interface. Mm. Um, yeah, so this is for, for the updating of the interface, and this can also be asynchronous, so it doesn't have to, but it can be asynchronous, like it can be in some other component, and it can take some time, it can be yeah. asynchronous, like in secure as, you know, you but have the immediate response, like user clicks, and the, and the response is, doesn't work, it's sold out, it comes from the right right side, from the right models. Yeah, so you, you, for, for this case, you need some, some update information here as well, I guess. Or maybe if you have a synchronous loop, then you can go through this very quickly. Yeah. Maybe you have a synchronous and an asynchronous or something, I don't know. That is, that is not so very much related to event sourcing, but more to the general architecture, so I'm not not focusing on this here too much. There was you I was wondering, in, do we need this command process in white model or can we just say the user tried to book a ticket and we write this as an event to the store and we give it to the view to make sense of the event where it would happen before. So I guess in both cases right now you would have an event whether whether it was sold or not, but why not just write user tried to buy the ticket? 
and then as you do that, the read model, you see whether you actually bought a ticket. Yes, so you can do, so the question was, do we have to have a command processor here that does the decisions, or can we just record that the user tried to buy a ticket, and then here, see whether it was actually possible, and then we need to roll back or something. I guess that's what you meant? Well, almost. No need to roll back, it's just, the user tried to buy a ticket, it's an event that happened. <coughs> it just doesn't mean, just means he didn't get a ticket. So you have to look at the whole event score to get the view of who got tickets. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I think, so, so this is actually um, um, an architectural decision, how you shape your events. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I would probably rather go for trying to decide as much up front as possible, because then I, ha I have more of the domain decisions like at hand, actually, and not spread out somewhere else in my system. But that's just the gut feeling, so I wouldn't know how to actually do this. Wow, lots of questions. Um, is there something like the transactions of several commands? Can you want to match them together or keep them in common? Um, so the question was asked, is there a transactional model? So um, oftentimes it's the case that uh, there's just one command and if this triggers a lot of actions, then you would want to shape it so that you just have one command for all of this together, and then you can get a bunch of events out of this that do different things in different places. And that would be the transactional model. So that you, you shape your system in a way that you only have one command, and then you can get out many events, of course. Um, usually this is not recorded. So you could either have one event that um, where many read models get get triggered or, or do some, some changes based off this one event, or you could just have multiple events that are sort of unrelated but just happen all together. And that's the transactional boundary you get usually. So from how I know it. I'm not sure whether I should say that, but you're bringing back the beautiful world of the 14th century. Oh, really? You know, because what you're talking about with your event store is like, seems to me like a general ledger or a diary or journal. Yes, just yes. Of things that happen in the world. Yes. And if I run on, I would say as system administrators, we always had that. It's called a locked file. Yes, but, as but yes. Business, I would argue that CERN and Daisy, we did that. We wrote tons, millions of events on tape and stored them. Yes. And then in the middle of the 90s came a bunch of, you know, uh, database people who didn't understand the world and they invented an object-oriented uh, conspiracy that is actually <laughs> all our lives. Yeah, we had that. In our general ledgers and to atoms and bits and pieces and distributed them everywhere. And by now, yesterday, I had an architectural workshop with an insurance company and they simply don't understand how people are connected to contracts anymore and changes of contracts it's because they don't have a general ledger. Basically, yeah. they have distributed it all out over the world. Yes, yes. Yeah, so, so I was... Bring back the beauty of a general ledger. Like I, I was actually waiting for somebody to say, but isn't this the f same as a log fire? So thank you for this. <laughs> and yes, in a way it is, but do you in general use your log file in your application to derive information of a bit? I doubt it. So usually a log file for me is just write only. And if there is a problem, then your administrator will curse and, uh, you know, uh, uh, dive into this and curse a lot and take hours and hours to dig up some information and hope that it actually got logged in an understandable way and that there is actually enough information in this log recording so that they can track this back to the actual error that happened. But this is here a log file, so to speak, that automatically gets reused in all your applications. So the log file gets like your source of truth for your application. Okay, so that's that. But yes, thank you, it's like a general ledger, I think. Yeah. Okay, so I think I need to speed up a little bit because otherwise I get uh, in conflicts here with the 
uh, session host. Okay, but we are almost there. So the standard event sourcing here is we have incremental updates of the event store and then we have those projections that reduce the event store to the current state of the system um, to the read and write models and they are used all over like your screens or whatever you, you display to the user and also for the decisions if you want. Um, if you do this with the, uh, with the right models, then it's very good to have them updated synchronously because then they can actually give out up-to-date information. But I made it a star next to that so that I don't forget to mention that, of course, if you cannot do this, then you need to handle this in a different way in your application. Like, for example, you might actually hand out a ticket to the person and then later on discover that you're overbooked and then you need to retract and and sort of, you know, uh, you know, take it away again or something, right? cancel it again. Okay? And those read models, because, you know, reading is always outdated and so it doesn't matter if they are actually outdated from the start or whether they get outdated right after they arrived at your browser. So we can have those asynchronously. Um, this is also nice with this uh, micro, um, I don't say this. <laughs> okay, um, so now let's go to the event sourcing in the front end. And the thing is, uh, event sourcing in the front end, like what? Because we have no application server, we have no relational database, and we have no application state in the front end, right? Wait, no application state, really? I mean, nowadays we have those single page applications, right? And there we do have tons of state. I'm currently writing a program uh, and we will have like a hundred megabytes of state in the front end. Yeah, you can do that. Browsers are very robust nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> it's not in production yet. <laughs> okay, so in the front end, we um, nowadays often find um, the, uh, something that's called the Redux data flow or if you like to speak in architectural terms rather than an implementation in library terms, this is the flux pattern, or a variant of the flux pattern. So what happens in this flux pattern? Um, usually you have a component, like some button or a screen or whatever, and the user does something there or something happens, and that triggers an action. And this action then, uh, in Redux, gets uh, sent to uh, a set of reducers, and those reducers, well, they actually reduce this action, and they produce a state tree. And this, so this is, this is the state of our application in the front end. And this state is then fed into the components again. The components display the new data where, where it's necessary, and then it uh, all starts again. Okay, and this is very popular for single page applications nowadays. Um, yeah, you can use it with, uh, I think, with all of the major um, front-end technologies like React and Angular and Vue and all over. Um, and it has those actions and those reducers. And yeah, if we think about this for a bit, isn't this actually like the events and the projections that we had before? And yeah, but where is our event store here? Right? So this is sort of missing. And. Uh, if we look at this, so this is the same, just you know, vertically, so a bit more space here. So usually in, in React and Redux, there is no event store. Well, maybe there's one under the hood, but nothing that's accessible to the user. And so Redux actually turns this event source, sort of event source architecture into our relational database architecture because it only keeps the current state. And then um, what, you can usually do is uh, in, in a standard application is that you need to persist this in the backend, of course, because your browser can be shut down at any minute, so you need to have some persistence somewhere else. And so the backend actually contains the source of truth. So I gave it a little halo here, so you can see that this is really our nice and shiny source of truth, okay? Um, and then, um, if you want to persist something, you just send the data. So this action here 
gets maybe also uh, also sends some data, so uh, issues an AJAX call and sends some raw data to this thing here and on load or at some other point in time um, this data gets sent back to the front end so the front end knows where we are at currently. But this is also only the current state. Um, and also there is no events and no information and all the data is dropped. So, but what if we actually want the front end to be the source of truth? Like in the application I'm currently writing, the front end actually determines everything that happens and just informs the back end. And the back end then takes measures on this, but the front end actually decides this has happened and that has happened. And so what uh, I did in this project is I added uh, another reducer, and that just reduces to the list of events that I have. So I just keep track of all of my events just there with another reducer. So Redux doesn't give this to me for free, so I can just easily implement it, right? So now all of a sudden I have the halo here, which is very nice, and I have this nice um, list here. Um, that uh, keeps track of all of my events in the front end, right? And so now when I want to persist this, what I can actually do is I just send this list to the back end and tell the back end here, hold this for me please, until I ask you for it again. And then when I get started the next time, I will just ask for this list here. And so the back end doesn't have any idea what this is or what the data actually means or something. And I just get back the list of events and then what I will do is I will get this and then I will feed this into my reducers and my reducers know what to do with this data, right? Because that's how I initially created my data, my current state, and so I will feed them the, the list of events again and get to the current state again. And then everything, yeah, starts all over. Um, yeah, and, and so here what we now have is we have an event source front end and the backend is, back is only there to persist this, uh, this data, uh, the, the event source list. And the backend doesn't know about the data, so the front end is really, has really become a charge. Right? That's a possibility to also implement event sourcing in the front end. And now if we, if we look at the backend and the front end, maybe they need to communicate. and. How could they communicate? Well, with events, why not? So what we could do here is we could have this front end again, uh, we could have our source of truth here again and our event source front end. Um, and then we also have the back end that, that persists this, but this is really not relevant, so I turned it a bit gray here so it doesn't stick out as much because this is just a necessary evil to keep track of the stuff. That's not important. And now what we can also do, if the backend is also event source, and the backend uh, wants to send some information to the front end, it can do so through web sockets, for example, and it can use an event that the front end actually understands. Or if the front end doesn't understand, we could implement a little layer in here where it gets translated to the front end language if they are like different, speaking different languages and we don't want to, you know, force either side to adhere to the language of the other side, we could, we could add a little translator in here. And then this event also gets fed into our reducers and will then go through this loop, um, just as the other data. And we could also go the other way around. So if the front end needs to send some information to the back end, we could just send the raw data, we could as well send the whole event and then the backend can work on this event and get all the information that is there with this. Okay? And then if we really want to decouple this further, we could also use an event queue here or a message queue, for example, to, to decouple those systems. Also, of course, uh, it can, this and this can be the same backend, but they don't have to. So we could talk to different backends that are event sourced via events, but we only need this one backend here that keeps track, that helps us uh, secure 
our source of truth, our front end source of truth. Okay? So, yeah, and that's basically what I wanted to talk to you about, just a second. Um, to summarize this, so use event sourcing if you don't want to drop data. And you will also get the benefit of being able to quickly add new features that you haven't thought about based off of the old data. You can use this in the front end and in the back end and also in between. And yeah, that's it. So we have lots of time for questions again. Yes, it's just a comment. Oh, sure. Oh. Yes. Yet if you build a banking system that does bookings, then you have some sort of truth arbitration centrally. Yes. It's just some, something you have to aware of. Yes. You have some sort of yes. With truth variations. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was trying to aim at with this. Uh, the right model has to be synchronous or not. You may have different like uh, um, negotiation aspects there. Maybe for the chat client, you would need to, uh, to have a web socket to all chat clients, and then if somebody writes something in some front end, then it would get, get sent to the back end as an event and then redistributed to the others. But that's not what's happening. Due to performance reasons, what's happening is chat clients. Well, I'm not sure about all chat clients, but the distributed stuff does. It allows you to answer even though not all participants in the group distribution might have already received the previous yes. note. No, that's, what, not what, that's not what I was talking about. I was trying to say if somebody writes something in some client and sends this to the back end, then this will get redistributed to all the other clients. Yeah. And then the other clients need to somehow fit this into the stream of things, you know, and then it might pop up. Somewhere, if if somebody in that client has already written something, then probably they don't the, the they other don't message will pop. They don't, they don't so okay. You have different, you have different chat, uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. This. The but it doesn't make sense as a, as a user if your chat somehow magically reorders itself after somebody climbed down from the mountain and received an answer. I see. Yeah, I would say this is uh, this is a, um, a business decision yes. how you want this to behave, and you can do it like this, and you can do it like that. So you can do it on receive and on timestamp, and you're free to decide in your client. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks for the remark. Any other questions? Yes, please. So you mentioned don't drop data. Um, so my heart is uh, finer in space. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, that that's interesting. Like already, I don't know, five or so years ago, or ten years maybe even by now, somebody uh, told me about a talk he had heard, and where the the, the speaker gave the recommendation that uh, um, by that time already, hard disk space was so cheap that it's more expensive to clean up your data and to, to you know throw out old stuff. And you should rather make sure that you have good tags and good metadata so you can find the data easily. But it's not interesting to you know just keep your data um, arbitrarily small by, by cleaning it up, just buy a new hardware. Okay. So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So a replay or a coming to a persistent, coming to a certain state within a finite time is uh, crucial. So how big are your even traces or your even block system? Are these in gigabytes or in terabytes? Or so um, 
you can um, work around this. So if it really takes you a long time to rehydrate your database, then you can store snapshots in between. That's a possibility. Um, the, the first system I talked about, that was in finance. And they had millions and millions of events in there because they kept track of asset price changes and stuff like that. And this happens a lot, really. And so um, it took them about 10 minutes to hydrate the system. So to go from boot up, and they would have a, a load balancer, and that would handle that, you know. So the system is only healthy after all the data gets loaded, and only then it would be switched into the the, uh, the um, uh, load balancer. And so I would say, okay, let's take the 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour or so with with the beef, you know. Um, but but if you really, if it would take you like two days or so, then maybe either your data is, or your your um, projections are somehow not suboptimal, or you could uh, look into starting to, to take snapshots, where you would store a certain uh, state and then the number up until which event you read this, and then you can start off from there. Many, many versioning systems are faced with exactly that problem. I mean, even databases like Postgres keep an event ledger. Oh, really? It's, yeah, I mean, it's called the page file, and they um, make sure that all the actions on the database are executed in one zip. Yeah, they make sure it's done. They waste the page file just with, yeah, I mean, the database, but they, they face the exact problem with those events. I mean, and versioning systems already face those events. I mean, Yes. Platforms like Git es essentially are event sourcing systems. Yes. Sort of. So, yeah, so the yeah, obvious yeah, so solutions to those problems. So. Uh, so if you send the whole event queue to the client, you probably want to start with a snapshot anyway. So um, what, what I do is I don't send the whole event queue all the time. I send uh, the delta. To, to yeah, the back end. On the first, like when you, when you open the web, web page, you, you don't want to, to download a gigabyte of events. You want to get one snapshot and then be pushed. Yeah, so if this is really a gigabyte and you would send that to the front end, then I would probably also think about snapshotting. But usually, you know, events are not that large because you, you have a type and then you have some data. And then so you can have a lot of events already just in a few megabytes. And yeah. Yeah. I need to uh, find out, you know, where the sweet spot is. I guess <laughs> at some point the client will call me and say, "No, it doesn't work anymore." Yes. The the model you showed here uh, is very very good for understanding, but uh, for the beginning. But in variable systems, I think it looks a bit simplistic because if you have a complex system, uh, this event system is event modeling is the main modeling. Yes, and of course. And developing sof software over a certain time, months, years, and it's a great system, you have the main model changes yes. and has to change yes. because you have different requirements. Yes. That also means that your event system, that the event types are changing. Yes. And uh, so the problem here starts, uh, starts where the events change and you must always be possible uh, it be uh, capable to read old events, yes, and uh, this restricts the, um, the domain modeling because uh, you must understand your first event you have to put it in the event queue, um, and which might be uh, uh, very different and not well suited to what you have in your system now. Let's say five years later. Yeah, so uh, what you can always do is you can add new events, right? That doesn't harm anything. But if you actually want to, to uh, modify events, then what you can do is um, you can also add a new version of this event. And then, you know, you have the old one. And uh, you need to, of course, keep the, the code that uh, operates on the old one. But what you can also do is you can apply something like an anti-corruption layer where you would transform the, uh, the old event into a, a new event, uh, and then your, uh, your, um, all the code that's behind 
doesn't and does never know about the old event. You just transform it away in your application, in your anti-corruption layer. That's what you could do and what people do. So, um, and you could of course also do something else, but everybody always says don't do this, but maybe at some point they all do this, and that's rewrite your event stream and modify the events. But usually people say don't do this unless you're in really, really, really specific situations and you can't work around this. What about schema evolution? Yeah, this is basically add a new event. Yeah. It can have a very similar name and very similar fields, but maybe just one field is different. Maybe you move from one, one data point to a list of data points or something, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you can, you can keep track of this. For, for example, yeah, either you either you have type and version or you have a new type, which is yeah. like very similar. Maybe the type contains a number or something. Yeah, yeah. But if you think of bookkeeping, maybe you just don't alter your ledger. Yes. It, uh, you alter your ledger, it's changing history, that's exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that that's why people say don't do this. But of course you can do it. But know what you are doing there and so decide uh, uh, don't, don't do this easily. So maybe we should take this discussion offline because uh, oh, cool. we never have much time. Um, I guess you're happy to discuss. Uh, of course. Of course. So